I've always been into racing at some level, whether it's Bonneville or motorcycles. Competition just breeds excellence, in my opinion, and nobody exemplifies that more than Porsche. I grew up in Los Angeles in the Hollywood area, and when you grow up in Southern California, I mean, cars are a big part of the culture. I mean, it's surf, cars, rock and roll, you know, and I was the, the model citizen there. I always loved cars a lot. I saved my money. My parents convinced me, like, if I saved my money, that they would help me buy my first car. So that was, that was the deal. And so um, in 1960, I was 19 years old. My parents thought, well, I guess he's ready for his car. I, at that point, I wanted a very high horsepower Chevrolet with a four speed. That was kind of the car to have at that moment. And so I went and I priced out a Biscayne, which was the cheap, cheap model car, which I knew would appeal to my parents. You know, it was the low end, it wasn't a Bel Air or some fancy, but it had a big engine and a four speed and they didn't know anything about that. So that, that all worked. And, and so I was really just about ready to place the order. It was $2,400. And I'd always seen and admired these little Porsche cars that were running around in the late 50s. And, and <clears throat> I thought, you know, I'm just going to check that out. And right near me in Hollywood was a dealership called Competition Motors, which was run by John Von Neumann, who was the Porsche distributor. So I went up there and I talked to John Von Neumann about ordering a Porsche. And he said, well, if you, at that point in time, if you ordered it in Europe, you could save several hundred dollars. So for $2,700, I could buy an absolutely stripped down Porsche, 60 horsepower, you know, the low engine, no option. I went back to my parents and I said, I, I've decided against the Chevrolet. I want to get a compact car, uh, an economy car with 60 horsepower. And that really appealed to them. And so they had to come up with half of $2,700. I had the other half and I put the order in for Porsche. That was in 1960. I, I took a year out of school and traveled Europe. And so I picked up the car in, in, I think it was May of 1961. So from 1961 to today, I've been a huge fan of Porsches and I've never been without one. I think I've had almost every year some form of Porsches. I really prefer driving cars like the RS or the early S's. It's a brand that appeals to all age groups. Everybody loves a Porsche. Caretaking for the Le Mans winning 935 was just amazing. We've had this car 10 or 15 years, and we've taken it to Laguna Seca, we've taken it to Pebble Beach a couple times, uh, Rensport, and we've shared it with as many people as we can whenever we're asked. It was a, a, a basically a, a, a privateer entry in 1979 when the factory entered two prototypes 936s, the presumptive winner in 1979 were the Porsche prototypes. And it didn't quite work out that way. Instead, the car behind me, the 935, won overall at Le Mans, which is an epic win. The Whittingtons were real competitors and were fearless competitors. They contested the Indy 500. They raced unlimited aircraft. Obviously, they did their fair share of sports car driving, but they were, without a doubt, champions of the drug trade, which gave them resources to buy state-of-the-art equipment. They say you can either go to a team like Kremer, that's a Kremer car, as being the world's greatest driver, or coming with great sponsorship, or come with money to buy the ride. And they came with allegedly $100,000 each to be able to drive that car at Le Mans. Don, who was the older brother, just like the day before Le Mans, went to the Kremers and said, okay, I'd like my brother Bill to start, then I'll go, and then Klaus Ludwig, who was their team driver, then he should go. And Manfred, who kind of did the strategizing, no, 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 he said, this is my car, and I, I'll tell you, Ludwig is gonna go first, and then you two boys work it out. Don said, well, if this is our car, then can we make the decision? If it's your car, you make the decisions. They said, well, how much does it cost to be our car? Well, they came up with a number that was staggering. So they bought the car the day before and, and Bill went first and Don went second and Klaus went third. And the rest is history. They won overall, which was just unheard of. It wasn't long after that, that the Whittington's uh, profession caught up with them and they were convicted of whatever they did in the drug trade and they went, they went away. 
And I always got a kick out of Bill because I got to know Bill as years went on. And he would say he went to Yale. And so um, when they finished their obligations, uh, they came back out and um, they went back to their old ways, their winning ways, and they chartered aircraft to less than legal entities. Let me just say that. And this was in 2013. And, and so Albert Arciero, who has a big name in racing, noticed that the, 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 the DEA was raiding the Whittington offices. And so he, it was in the news and there were pictures and so forth. So he distributed pictures to Bruce Canop and myself. Look at the Whittingtons are back in trouble again, you know. So I, I just looked at it and didn't give it a lot of thought. But Albert and Bruce decided this was too good an event to pass up. They decided to do it at a winter speed event at Laguna Seca. And I was so excited because it was the first time I was driving the car. And so, um, so of course, when I came back from my session, the garage was blocked and I couldn't pull in, so I parked it right there, you know, little that I know. I mean, I was clueless, I had no idea. And so I get out of the car, I'm Mr. Happy. It was the first time I drove the car. I mean, it's an incredible car. I went running over to talk to a friend of mine and just compare notes about driving a 935. Well, meanwhile, the whole entourage had been circling the pits. A black Charger, a black Suburban, a black flatbed with guys with marine, you know, wraparound glasses that obviously don't belong there. I mean, they look like special forces. And they're just cruising the pits and everybody's looking like, what are these guys doing here? So it, that, that created some attention. And they came in, they parked in front of it, they parked beside it and around it, and they got out and they're all badged, DEA jackets on, Glocks, handcuffs, and they surround the car. And so I'm down a ways and they said, is the own, owner of this car here? And so the fellow that was you know, giving me race support said, Bruce, I think you need to come back to your car. There's some guys that want to talk. So I just go jumping back and think, somebody wants to talk about the car, I'm ready, let's talk, you know. And as I get closer, here are these guys with the badges. You know, as I approach these guys, I realize that these were law enforcement officers. They were standing there just waiting for me. And I, I, my first thought was, did I pay my taxes? What have I done? I mean, I just thought, oh my God, I've never been, I've never seen anything like this in my life. And so they said, um, good afternoon, you know, my name is Officer so-and-so. And he gave me his card, they printed cards. And he said, is this your car? And I go, yes, it is. And he said, well, I I'm sorry to tell you, this is part of an ongoing drug investigation. We're gonna have to um, seize the car. And, and it was so current because they just, the Whittingtons had just gotten re-indicted. So it made sense. And these guys held everybody away, like physically, like, no, you stay there, do not. Get. And so I was like surrounded by this group. They compared everything, it was the car. And so they said, I'm sorry, we're gonna have to take the car. So I actually helped push it onto the flatbed because we had to build ramps. It was the flatbed with a big J hook, you know. I wasn't gonna put the hook on the car. They drove off with the car. And right when I come back to the pit, I see the car coming on the flatbed back my way. And I'm thinking, oh my God. I couldn't imagine what they were coming back for. The head guy got out of the Suburban and he said, Bruce, you've been pranked. And then he, oh, behind me are all my buddies just like, this is just too good, you know. And so unbeknownst to me, they, they had two of my closest friends, Charlie Nierberg and Chip Connor to uh, finance this caper. They hired a movie director, a movie producer, a consultant and actors and they rehearsed and they did it right. Their consultant was actually uh, a special forces and, and an employee of the DEA at one time and an attorney's. So they had government, real government license plates on the Suburbans and real badges and glocks and handcuffs. So anyways, it was, it was a moment that I'll never forget. And um, whenever I think of that car, I think of the moment, you know, that had me going. My name is Bruce Meyer. I'm the founding chairman of the Peterson Automotive Museum. I've been passionately driving Porsches for over 60 years, and I am Porsche.